I'm delighted to invite Professor Mark Pallon to present his inaugural lecture entitled Nothing in Microbiology Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. Before we get stuck into the body of the talk, I'd just like to add a few online extras. So live tweeting is welcome, you, uh, and there's the hashtag for it. The slides are already available on SlideShare. Uh, there's an online guide. So some of you probably will have this kind of ADHD where you can't just listen to me. You'll be on your phones and tweeting, and, and there's one just doing it now, you see. <laughs> so you can follow uh, all of the, uh, the sources of what I've said and further background information using that, or you can do it at home if you, if you like. Um, and this is being live streamed uh, to, um, uh, to the YouTube channel of the, of the medical school. So it's a bit like on those quiz shows where they say hello to all the listeners on Dave. Hello to anyone who's out there watching us on YouTube at the moment. Um, I'm releasing the th words coming out of my mouth and the slides under Creative Commons license. The university is retaining the copyright to the video. And just in case anyone doesn't know, we're going for drinks afterwards at the Varsity Pub. I'd also like to uh, uh, put this lecture in, in memoriam of three individuals who've had an influence over my life, I suppose, and over the, the, dis the, the academic disciplines in which I, I uh, dwell. Uh, I'm not going to say more about them, um, but they've all died in the last few years, and it will become clear what their influences are uh, later on. And I have to acknowledge, get the acknowledgements out of the way first, so I acknowledge all the people I'm currently working with, all of my research group. I'm not going to name them because we don't have time, uh, but again, if you look online, you'll find all that information. And similarly, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have influenced the trajectory of my life, of my academic life, uh, of uh, my intellectual development over the years. And again, I'm not going to go through and mention all of them, um, Peter has already mentioned some of the people who have actually come here today and I'm very grateful for that. Another thing I have to say, get this, get this out of the way as well, is that I'm not obsessed with Darwin. <coughs> okay, despite quoting him at my wedding, calling two of my children Charles and Emma, <laughs> uh, being on first name terms with two of his descendants, writing scholarly works on his uh, you know, I know other people who are. J John Van Wy, now in Singapore, he's definitely obsessed with Darwin. Alison Pern, who works for the... Um, uh, Darwin Correspondence Project, she's obsessed with Darwin. Randall Kane, Darwin's great-great-grandson, he's obsessed. I just have a passing interest, uh, and I'm over that now, really. But it's a bit like I I if Paul McCartney were to do a concert um, and he just did the Frog Chorus, uh, the audience would be disappointed. You know, they're waiting for Hey Jude. So I'm going to have to put in a bit of Darwin. I can't help it. Uh, so there will be some of that as we go through. So what I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover the history of life, history of the universe really, history of science, history of me and my science, uh, century by century, decade, decade by decade since the beginning. Now you might say, well that's rather a hard undertaking, you've got less than an hour to do this, it's simply not going to be possible. Well, we have to do what the mathematicians call simplification, we're going to make a simplifying assumption. Simplifying assumption is that the world, as we know it, was actually created on November the 24th, 1859, with the, at the time that Darwin published The Origin of Species, and it was endowed by its creator with the semblance of a long history that goes back billions of years, but that was all just a ruse, and it actually came into existence on, on that particular date in 1859. So that makes it easier. We've got you know, a century from 1859 to 1959 to cover, then we can go through the various decades since my birth in 1960, and it, it should be therefore fairly straightforward. So, 1859, the first thing we have to talk about is obviously Darwin and Darwin's influence on modern thought. And just to, to recap here, I'm drawing on uh, an essay by Ernst Meyer, who is one of the uh, kind of godfathers of, of evolution, uh, lived to be over 100 years old. Um, and he basically distilled out of all of Darwin's work a number of ideas. He said that Darwin basically gave us the notion of branching evolution, of the common descent of all living things told us that the mechanism of evolution was largely, but not exclusively, natural selection, uh, that evolution was gradual with no major discontinuities. And he pointed out that evolutionary biology is, unlike, say, chemistry, is a historical science. In evolutionary biology, you're looking to reconstruct what's happened in the past and come up with narratives to explain how things have come to be the way they are. The other interesting point that, that May uh, pulled out is that basically, uh, evolution feeds on variation and randomness. 
um, and it ba banishes this kind of typological thinking where you can capture everything in one particular instance and, and also banishes determinism. Um, so for tidy minds, this is a, a bit of a problem. Uh, you know, you like everything to be the same. Physicists say that one electron represents all electrons in the whole universe. But we as biologists recognise that one organism is going to be different from the next organism and the next organism all the way through the population, pretty much. Now, while we're thinking about Darwin, I'm just going to bring in one other thing that I will come back to, which is that um, it's often difficult to actually do your thinking purely in your head. Um, and sometimes you have to have tools outside of yourself to, to use to actually uh, do uh, thinking, research and so forth. And Darwin actually did this in a big way with his notebooks. And the, he's kept these very complex and detailed notebooks. Um, and we've, we have these and they're all available online. And it was one of the great pleasures of writing The Rough Guide to Evolution was I actually forced myself to go and read them all. And there's some wonderful things in there. Um, here's a, uh, a sketch there that he drew of uh, an evolutionary tree, the one of the first trees that ever drawn to describe evolution. <coughs> Um, and you can see the dotted lines are the extinct things and then the, the solid lines are his idea of, of current species. And, you know, his thoughts range very widely over all sorts of things. You know, a man in Shrewsbury who used to call people bastards uh, when he was drunk and someone who tried to have sex with a, with a, a bird and all sorts of weird things. In, in fact, I have a whole talk called The Rough Guide to Darwin where we go into Darwin's dirty, as we might call it. But I'm just going to share with you this, just this one quote here, which I think is is particularly poignant, um, uh, where he says, if we choose to let conjecture run wild, then animals are fellow brethren in pain, disease and death, suffering, famine, are slaves in the most laborious works, are companions in our amusement. And then he kind of makes this point that we may partake from our origin in one common ancestor, we may all be netted together. And in a sense, that's, uh, that prefaces uh, all of the animal rights movement and the interest in uh, ecology and, and sharing the world with, with these animals and, uh, and also um, vegetarianism, if you like. So what else went on? Well, around the same time, um, Mendel was doing his experiments on peas and the, the, the discipline of genetics kind of booted itself up rather belatedly. So Mendel did his experiments they were forgotten about and ignored for uh, several decades and then around the beginning of the 20th century they rediscovered uh, various other uh, insights that, that came into genetics, the difference between Surma and germ, germ line and chromosomes and mutations. And then in the 1940s evolution and genetics were fused together to what's <coughs> become called the, the modern synthesis uh, with various architects there, including Dobzhansky who we'll hear more about later. Okay, that's one thread. So we've got evolution, genetics, um, another uh, development that was going on uh, around that time, in fact predating, I've kind of gone back in time here before the 1859, but in the 1830s Babbage was uh, working on the analytical engine, uh, first uh, uh, modern, if you like, computer. Um, Ada Lovelace, uh, Byron's daughter, wrote the first program for it. Um, in fact, Darwin met Babbage at dinner uh, several times, I think. Um, Boole invented Boolean algebra in the 1850s. Um, I put in some stuff about uh, just a mention of Turing here for John Heath, because he's obsessed with Turing, as I am with Darwin. And then the 1950s, we started to see computers as we know them. But probably the largest uh, conceptual leap forward, the one with the most impact, was the idea of germ theory, the development of germ theory, uh, which followed Darwin's <coughs> Origin of Species a few years later, sort of kicking off with Pasteur demolishing the idea of spontaneous generation, and in the 1870s, Koch linking anthrax to bacteria. Uh, Ferdinand Cohn, German um, bacteriologist, founding bacterial taxonomy. And it's worth noting there, we're going to root everything in Darwin, that Cohn and Darwin actually had quite a lively correspondence. Um, and uh, Darwin was kept up to date with the developments in, in, in microbiology through that correspondence. And in the 1880s, uh, TB, cholera, diphtheria, all linked to, uh, to germs, to, to bacteria, development of anti-serum. Two papers there which are particularly worth noting, Koch at, from Koch and Graham. Koch, first of all, pointing out in 1881 that it was a good idea to grow bacteria on a solid medium, and you could get colonies and you could propagate them in pure culture. And Graham pointing out that you could stain them in a particular way down the microscope and um, differentiate them um, and identify them. And I mention that because actually 
not much has changed in microbiology since the 1880s, since those two papers. <laughs> if we fast forward now to 19, the 1940s, uh, Julian Huxley, uh, who was the grandson of Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, there's Julian Huxley on his grandfather's knee. He was quite strident in saying, well, bacteria, they're not real organisms, they don't have genes in the, in the normal sense, you know, genetics doesn't apply to bacteria. Uh, so he you know, put his head above the parapet, and he was wrong, uh, but uh, that's what they said then. Then you fast forward another decade or so, and you get to Dobzhansky, one of the architects uh, of this uh, modern synthesis, and in his 1951 edition of his book, Genetics and the Origin of Species, he then points out that yes, there are genes in bacteria, and you can show mutations, and you can, and in fact, the first mutations were described as uh, in, 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 as antibiotic resistance mutations. Um, and so this brought bacteria into the fold of genetics and part of that uh, modern synthesis, if you like. So another interesting thing happened in the 50s, which was that the structure of DNA was revealed. But again, as we have to keep harking back to Darwin, there's an interesting factoid here for those uh, of you who are interested in such things. It turns out that Darwin wrote his last uh, paper, the research paper, just, it was published just a few days before he died in 1882, in April 1882, and in that paper he thanks a certain William Drawbridge Crick of Northampton who had supplied Darwin with information on the spread of a bivalve mollusk by being stuck onto the leg of a beetle. So Darwin was, was uh, obsessed with the idea of how, how do things get dispersed around the world, how do they move uh, organisms, how do you actually account for their movement. So he was very interested in that and wrote up a little piece thanking Crick. Now it turned out that that Crick had a son who then had a, who had a son himself. So uh, William Drawbridge Crick was in fact the grandfather of the Crick that wrote the Crick and Watson paper that came out in April 1953 and revealed the structure of DNA. So kind of everything does connect. 1960, now that was a year, that was the year I was born. Uh, you can hear, see some of these family photographs. Here's my uh, family here having lunch on the, on the new Coronation, Coronation Street uh, soap opera that they starred in. Uh, here's my mother and one of her friends re reading Lady Chatterley's Lover that year. Uh, there's my dad just returning from uh, his military service because he still, they still had to do that kind of thing in those days. And anyone know who this person is in the corner? Peter Medawar. So Peter Medawar got his Nobel Prize that year for uh, work in immunology. And as an aside, if we want to show that there's an obsession with Darwin. In fact, Peter Medawar basically showed that you could explain all of immunology through evolution. So nothing in immunology makes sense except in the light of evolution because of clonal selection theory, which is a variant of, of, of Darwin's selection. 1964, we come to uh, the source of the title for this lecture, which is that uh, Dobzhansky wrote this piece uh, in The American Zoologist. And there, there are two interesting features here. So on one side here, you can see he's fussing about the fact that molecular biology was taking over. Uh, and it's just amazing to me, uh, both here, I think, and certainly in Birmingham, people in schools of life sciences or biosciences are all worrying about how do we keep organismal biology alive, whole organism biology, everything's becoming molecular biology or here, it's all becoming synthetic biology. And, you know, anything to do with animals and plants, real things like that, that are large and, and you can see them, that's all getting squeezed out. And so it's interesting that this is not new. This is going back norm, uh, 50 years that people were fussing about this. But also he makes this generalisation here where he's, uh, nothing makes sense in biology except in the light of evolution uh, or subspecie evolution. Is, is, I think that's he's aping Spinoza there. Um, and so he's just pointing out that, that basically life is a, a joke if you don't uh, take evolution into account, this fundamental unity um, and... Uh, he then turned that later, a few years later, into an essay, in fact. So now I'm just going to take a step out of this uh, chronological narrative, and just for those of you who are not biologists, uh, just to point out that we're <coughs> a lot of the talk's going to be about sequences. And basically we have two kinds of sequences in living organisms. We have those that are to do with information storage, and those that are turning information into action. Um, so we have genes that are made of DNA, and then we have proteins, and the DNA sequences encode those proteins. And if we take all the genes, all the DNA in a bacterium together, we call that its genome sequence. It's kind of complete genetic blueprint, to use a bit of a truism. 
So I've said all that because in 1965, another breakthrough came when Zucker, Candle and Pauling wrote a paper where they actually pointed out that you could use biological sequences to understand evolution um, uh, and, and actually draw up what they called a molecular phylogeny. So it was a, a, a very eventful paper, in some ways ahead of its time. It's also interesting to note how things have changed again in the last 50 years, because they actually quote Hegel in their introduction. That's their opening paragraph there, and they go on that using Hegel's expression, we may say uh, that there is no other system that is better aufgehoben. Um, I don't think anyone would write a paper like that these days. Um, Mark Huckman has pointed out they misuse the word aufgehoben there, um, but uh, we can talk about that maybe later in the bar. Um, so what they did basically was take this idea of homology, so many of you would be familiar with this, the, the textbook idea of homology that you look at the uh, disposition of uh, bones in the limb of a, of a tetrapod and you can see that there's an exact correspondence. Even though those limbs are doing quite different things, they obviously have similar kinds of structures and uh, morphology there uh, in a kind of deep sense. And in looking at, say, that red bone there, you could you could argue that, okay, so we've seen, we've dissected it in a human, we, we know which nerves go there, which blood vessels go there. We could make predictions as to what nerves and blood vessels would serve it in, say, a bird or, or a whale, even though it's a different context. So what Zucker, Candle and Pauling did was say, well, actually, you could do the same thing with sequences. If you line up the sequences, do what we call an alignment, you can look for things that are the same or similar in, in two different sequences, and you can look at these patterns of similarity and dissimilarity and draw conclusions about evolution and more generally draw conclusions about the function of the things that you're looking at. Just, just take another side step and, and spend a bit more time thinking about this because it is an important point. So uh, you can make an analogy, in fact Darwin made this analogy, that you can compare the evolution of life with the evolution of language. Um, and now that we understand about sequences, biological sequences, you can make this even more poignantly because both languages and informational macromolecules like DNA and protein consist of sequences of character, characters which change over time. They acquire small changes with each generation um, and, and slowly but certainly diverge. Um, and you can look at these patterns of uh, similarity due to descent from a common ancestor, i.e. homology, to infer function in the sense, biological sense or meaning in the linguistic sense. So if you look at these uh, one, two, three, eins, zwei, drei, und, uh, trois. You could say, well, actually, the first uh, two uh, sets of numbers there are more similar than the, the second set of two, and therefore you might want to classify those as more closely related and say the first two are Germanic languages and the second two are uh, Romance or, or Latin-derived languages. And, in fact, you can do this way back in, in, into the distant past. But this uh, guy, um, Bedrick Rosny, back in 1917, came across this Hittite inscription and recognised the word Ninda as, a, as an ideogram, a logogram from Sumerian that meant bread, and then just looked at the other words and was surprised to see this water, or wata, in the next line. And he actually then translated this as now you will eat bread and now you will drink water. So it's looking for these kinds of patterns of similarity and also looking for overlapping clues. So the fact that there was bread in one, wor in one sentence and then water in the next, uh, and there were two verbs that were in the same kind of thing. That all made sense. The point is, with, 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 uh, lang with, with language, we can go back 3,000 years, but with biological sequences, we can go back 3,000 million years, 3 billion years, uh, back to the last universal common ancestor. Anyhow, in the 1970s, Sanger invented DNA sequencing. So up until then, people have been largely sequencing bits of RNA or, and mostly proteins. Uh, but he came along and invented this method of sequencing, again, which stood the test of time um, for 30 years or more, uh, basically people still using this kind of approach. And even today, the approaches we use are variations on a theme of Sanger sequencing. OK, what about me? So in the 1970s, I went to this place here, Wallington High School for Boys. Uh, there's a picture of me. And there's a picture of my biology teacher, as he was then, 35 years ago or 36 years ago. Uh, a couple of uh, quotes there. One was from my school report, I think from the maths teacher, that said, must learn to control his grasshopper mind. Um, I do struggle to control my grasshopper mind, but I've managed to somehow make use of it. Um, and there's a quote there which I thought originally came from Huxley, but in fact, when you look, uh, it doesn't. It's been misattributed to Huxley. It's from, from an American journalist called Sidney Harris. But basically the primary purpose of a liberal education is to make one's mind a pleasant place in which to spend one's time. And I think 
that basically uh, sums up my education. I really didn't enjoy the time I spent at school and, and, and uh, I still look back on those times with fond memories um, and call upon all that. Now interesting though, I actually got my old school textbook out <laughs> and had a look at it. And there's, you go into the, the index and there's no DNA. It doesn't mention DNA in a biology textbook. Uh, so that's quite remarkable, I think. It really is full of lots of morphology of insects and plants, bryophytes and all that stuff, but no, no mention of DNA, no mention of sequences in there at all. But interestingly, I did do the Cambridge entrance exam in the seventh term uh, of the sixth form, uh, sorry, the fourth term of the sixth form, and um, the question that came up in the biology paper was to take a load of peptide sequences and assemble them into a protein. So that kind of, you could say, that set the tone for the rest of my working life, in a way. After that, I went to Fitzwilliam College uh, in Cambridge. I put a couple of quotes there. Those are actually from Darwin about his time in Cambridge, but they pretty much apply to my time in Cambridge as well. Uh, I did have a, 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 some good times there, but I don't remember much of the, of the course being particularly interesting. It was much more having discussions uh, with uh, fellow students about developments in the field. Um, and um, there's a guy, David Simmons, who's actually unfortunately not here today, but he, he was uh, um, much cleverer than I was and much more dedicated to his studies, uh, but we used to have interesting conversations. And um, One time I said to him as we were eating dinner in, in college, so how much genome do you think there is in this pork pie? Um, but that went too far for him. He said, oh, that's an absurd question. I'm just, just a stupid person to ask him silly questions like this. But of course, now with the horse meat scandal, they actually <laughs> are, that is exactly what people are asking. You know, they go and take the DNA out and they say, OK, there's horse DNA, but there's also something else DNA in there. Um, so I also did a final year project on leprosy, which was my first interest, I guess, in infectious diseases and in microbiology. And then I quickly bounced around, to, went to the London Hospital for a while, went to the Royal Free for a while, and I ended up at Bart's, um, Bart's Hospital in, in London. Now, late 80s, uh, bas basically there was this, for me, one of those kind of eureka moments when I went to the library, because you still had to go to the library in those days, there was no internet and stuff, and found this... Uh, this article by Carl Woese on bacterial evolution. It was a review article, and it basically summarised all that was known about bacterial evolution. And he actually um, proposed that, that, that uh, there was uh, three different kinds of life. So the idea of just being bacteria and eukaryotes, like we are, that have a, a membrane-bound nucleus, he said, well, actually, there's this other group called the archaea, which are just as deeply... Uh, branching um, as the other two and, and, and he came up with this kind of trichotomy um, of bacteria, archaea and eukarya. Um, so really this for me was, a, you know, at that time I was already interested in Darwin and evolution and biology and, and wanted to see this joining of bacteria um, and evolution and it was a great uh, joy to read that paper. But of course there is nothing new under the sun. If you look at that tree that we draw, we, we draw from, from Wose's developments, and you go back and look at Darwin's very first, or nearly first sketch of an evolutionary tree, you can see they're very similar. And in fact, if we apply this special uh, antidote to the invisible ink that Darwin used in his notebooks, you can see that Darwin did actually get there first and actually drew <laughs> Wose's tree a long time before he did. So as the 1980s turned into the 90s, I actually used that as an opening line in a grant proposal. I was told off for being a pompous twat by my colleagues. <laughs> um, as, the 1980s turned into, as the 1980s turned into the 1990s, it was a great time to be working inside the bachelor's uh, department with Brendan Wren, who's sitting there with her. Uh, it was a fantastic time in my life. Uh, it was a time where we first started to be able to use computers to find sequence homology, and this Apple Mac uh, was the first computer that I actually really uh, used in uh, for a long period of time and it transformed the way we were doing research at the time. So in, in the group at the time, one of my colleagues, Chris Clayton, had cloned a urease gene or thought he'd cloned a urease gene from a bacterial uh, host from, from Helicobacter pylori, um, but he wasn't certain and I used a computer, did some searches and said, yes, definitely you do have uh, the, uh, uh, the urease because it's 50% the same as this plant urease. And this convinced me that you could actually make a serious contribution to laboratory-based laboratory research by using computers, mucking about with computers. So I kind of redeemed my reputation. 
uh, from that. And then we went on uh, to look at some other genes as well, uh, uh, gene clusters. There's a butanol, butanol fermentation genes from Clostridium difficile. Um, and again, I, having this grasshopper mind, I got very excited about that because I recognised that those genes uh, that we got from C. difficile were in fact very, very closely related to genes from another organism called Clostridium acetobutilicum. And that pathway that those genes encoded was used by Heim Weizmann uh, to actually produce butanol during the First World War and uh, actually helped the, the British war effort. And that earned him the Balfour Declaration, which laid the seeds uh, for the formation of the State of Israel. So you can see everything connects again, uh, if you've got a grasshopper mind or night smooth thinking. Um, we also found a reverse transcriptase and a group 2 intron uh, at that time. And I started to get more and more interested in this idea of looking for distant homologies and looking for relationships between proteins and their constituent domains that were not quite obvious, that you had to scratch beneath the surface. But when you found them, it became obvious that they had some kind of meaning and could actually allow you to infer uh, commonalities in, in uh, structure, function and so forth. And it was a bit like doing a big a kind of molecular jigsaw puzzle. You're looking for all these clues that kind of intersect. As we move into the 90s more, though, uh, stress became a big theme in my life. Um, I basically went off and did a PhD working for Gordon Dugan uh, at Imperial College. Um, and at that time, people were very interested in stress responses in bacteria because they realised that actually when you grow a bacterium on a plate in a lab, it's a very artificial kind of thing to do. E. coli never has it quite so easy as it does uh, in, in a lab growing on a plate, same with salmonella. Um, and in the real world, they have to fight for a living. Um, and so there was a lot of interest in saying, well, what happens if you starve them? What happens if you heat shock them? Um, uh, and, and so forth. So I would got my PhD. Uh, I did spend three years full-time at the, at the bench. Uh, I went through the period of being the complete lab idiot and not knowing how to, to run a gel or hold a pipette, but uh, I made good on that. Um, and then shortly after that, I got BBSRC grant to continue this work and actually flourished quite well with this work on the starvation stress for a while. It was also a time of stress because I was on television as part of the Imperial College University Challenge team and we... Uh, I actually captained the, the team that won uh, that year in 1995. Um, and uh, you know, so that was stressful in a way. Also stressful was that was when we began our family. And uh, those of you who have young children will know that young children bring a certain degree of stress. Um, that stress doesn't actually go away for quite a few years. Uh, in fact, yeah, it doesn't go away. Uh, but <laughs> But I'm very, very pleased to see my four children here and I'm very proud of all the pleasure that they've given me as well as the stress over the years. <laughs> as we got into the middle of the 1990s, um, we saw the birth of what we might call bacterial pathogenomics. Uh, and I remember one of my colleagues, Duncan Maskell, coming into the lab breathless, having come from a meeting and we all gathered round and listened. And he told us about this guy called Craig Venter, uh, who had sequenced the genome of a bacterium. Haemophilus influenzae, and then to show that it wasn't, it wasn't just a one-trick pony, they'd sequence another one, Plasma gentalium, in double quick time. Um, and this was a, a real revelation. We, when we started seeing all these genome sequences coming out of bacteria in, in the late 1990s, uh, we realised that what we'd known about before, discovered biology before genomes, was really like the tip of an iceberg, and there was this great undiscovered biology. So even in an organism like E. coli that people have been studying for getting on for a century, over half the genes were only discovered when they actually sequenced the genome. We didn't know they existed until we got genome sequencing. And I actually made a, a good living for myself in this area. Um, got involved through Brendan in the first uh, Campylobacter jujuni genome sequencing project. And with Brendan wrote uh, a, a review in Nature uh, on the subject. Uh, ASM, the American Society of Microbiology, asked me to edit a book for them. I got involved in a couple of other projects with the Sanger sequencing genome. So it was a very exciting time uh, to be in the subject. But also, uh, around that time, I was also thinking, well, we need better <laughs> tools to think with. So coming back to what we said about Darwin's notebook, something, you, know, you sometimes need to get out of your head and actually look uh, and use other uh, uh, things out there. So during my PhD, I got familiar with the internet um, and I approached the British Medical Journal and said, would well, you want me to write something about the internet, how it might be useful for healthcare professionals? And they said, yeah, okay. So I wrote a series of articles, which then got turned into a booklet, uh, 
which then got translated into various languages. And um, I think you can still buy it on Amazon even to today, although it's well out of date. Uh, one of the ironic <coughs> things in there was it says, it, I said something to the effect that, oh, it's much better to look at email than snail mail because you never get any junk mail through email. <laughs> uh, I don't know how, how wrong I was back then. And we set up these databases as well. So to analyse all these genome sequences, even then, even when there was only a few genome sequences, it was quite, you can't just look at the ACs, Ts and Gs and make sense of it. So we tried to provide uh, these tools. And Roy Chowdhury, who's the first author of both these papers, is, is sitting up there at the back. Uh, we built these databases and we uh, built quite a following in, in the scientific community and helped the scientific community understand these genomes. As we got towards the end of that uh, decade, I um, got itchy feet. I moved from Barts, uh, then went to Belfast for a short time, and then ended up in Birmingham um, and came up with a, a whole new group of colleagues and new challenges and new interests uh, as I settled in there. So one of the first was uh, coming up against E. coli as a model organism. And, uh, Steve Busby, who's somewhere in the audience, I can't see him for looking, but he's, um, there he is over there. You know, he, he basically spent his whole life looking at this one strain of E. coli. And basically the view of people who work in, in, in model organism biology is, well, this, God created this organism. It's just, it hasn't, it's got no ecological context, no evolutionary context, it just is. And so I actually got quite cross about this and said, well, you know, it's actually an artefact. Um, and we wrote, I wrote a piece with John Hobman and Charles Penn where we, we, we said that these are not really model citizens. These are uh, this E. coli that have been propagating the lab for decades. It was a deceitful delinquent growing old disgracefully. Uh, and we pointed out that, you know, if you want to talk about real biology, you have to talk about fresh isolates that have come out for the real world, um, at least as well as your model organism. Perhaps one way to make this uh, sound um, more impactful is this is, um, say, E. coli in a state of nature, fresh-faced uh, uh, and, uh, you know, young-looking. Um, then it gets into the lab and it starts to degenerate a bit. <laughs> um, and before long it's actually achieved the status of becoming an icon. Um, and and that, that's my view of, of, of some of the work that's been done on model organisms, and we have to be careful there. Did do a lot of work uh, over those years on looking at evolution in E. coli, looking at... Uh, so we were surprised uh, to find that even in E. coli we could find remnants of systems that no longer work. There was this idea that, well, bacteria were small and perfectly formed, they had these compact genomes, and everything in them made sense in terms of current biology. But we, we showed that wasn't the case. And we also showed there were many ways to get to the same outcome. So a particular kind of E. coli called enterotoxigenic E. coli, it turned out that basically all it required was a toxin gene to come in on a plasmid and any old E. coli could become toxigenic. Uh, again, these overturned our prior assumptions. I also got interested in a system called type 3 secretion and we looked um, at the virulence effectors, the, the, so this is basically like a molecular syringe that injected things into to eukaryotic cells. And if you were an engineer, you'd design it all nice and compactly so you'd have the, the, everything together in one place. But what we discovered, that wasn't the case at all, that actually the effector genes, the things that do damage, uh, that encode the proteins that do damage, were scattered throughout the chromosome of E. coli and they were actually present on these mobile genetic elements called uh, bacteriophages that were popping in and out of the genome. So again, this was a surprise where we could see that evolution was a, a different kind of way of doing things than what we would have designed if we were actually engaged in some kind of synthetic biology. That also sparked an interest in, in, the comple in complexity. Um, so closely related to those type 3 secretion systems I just mentioned is the bacterial flagellum, which is the main organelle of motility in bacteria. And um, there were some uh, wrong-headed people particularly in the US, who were claiming that the bacterial flagellum was so ornately designed and so irreducibly complex, it must have been designed by a, a designer and it couldn't have evolved. And so we spent some time debunking that, but also generally looking at evolutionary relationships uh, uh, within this system. I also started running these Darwin Days once a year on Darwin's birthday at uh, the University of Birmingham. And, and it it did become a bit of an obsession, I have to admit. Now, now I'm in rehab, I can say that <laughs> looking back. But it did become a little bit over the top. But it was also a great reward. And, uh, you know, I got a great deal of pleasure out of this. Uh, there's me drinking champagne with Alice Roberts off the telly, who I recruited to a job in Birmingham. Uh, there I am with uh, Randall Keynes, Darwin's great-grandson, 
uh, and a series of evolutionary biologists going around Downhouse there, and with Benjamin Zephaniah Rast, a poet, who came and read some uh, uh, poetry out for us. We made a dub album of The Origin of Species with a Jamaican student, um, and I also have a cameo role in a rap uh, video. So it was all good fun, uh, and, and you know, I don't regret it. It was a bit obsessional. I think my wife probably got a bit fed up with it after a while, but uh, there we go. Particularly the writing of The Rough Guide to Evolution, which was the thing that really did drive me fairly nutty. 2008, as we're coming towards the end of that decade, uh, there's a particular uh, landmark here from Mark Uchman, who's in the audience, uh, and my old supervisor, Gordon Dugan, uh, where they showed that uh, they kind of went one step further than uh, Zucker, Candle and Pauline, where they were just talking about bits of sequence. They said you could actually use the whole genome of an organism, of a whole genome of a bacterium, as a document of its evolutionary history, and you can start to reconstruct the evolutionary history of bacterial species using this kind of approach. And around the same time, uh, this new type of sequencing called high-throughput sequencing came in. So basically the cost of sequencing plummeted and the ease of use uh, increased dramatically. Um, and I actually, uh, in more jocular moments, said, well, we're going to approach this sequencing singularity where sequencing will become so cheap that we can just, uh, just we'll use it for everything. And in fact, uh, you know, shortly after I said that, there was a paper in Nature where uh, some guys at the Sanger had actually taken the complete works of Shakespeare and translated them into DNA sequences and shown that they could store them uh, and then resuscitate them and so forth. Um, and uh, our, the opportunities were opened up greatly also by the availability of these uh, so-called desktop sequencing instruments about the size of a laser printer that basically meant you didn't have to work in a large dedicated sequencing centre anymore. Any small, medium-sized research group could kind of do this kind of stuff. One area we got into fairly early on was looking at bacterial evolution within uh, hospital outbreaks, um, looking at an organism called Acinetobacter baumannii in a local hospital, and also with uh, colleagues in Nottingham, um, an outbreak of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that had caused the problem. And we sequenced the whole genome and we were able to reconstruct uh, some of the transmission events that went gone on. More recently, we've been looking at a very large outbreak of this organism, Acinetobacter baumannii, uh, which went on for 80 weeks, involved military personnel and civilians at, at the hospital in Birmingham. And we genome sequenced uh, nearly 100 isolates from that outbreak. And we were able to reconstruct the, the phylogenetic trees, the evolutionary trees, and the transmission chains, working out who'd given it to whom, where they got it from. And then that allowed us to focus our infection control efforts. So it became clear that we couldn't account for everything by patients being in adjacent beds. And towards uh, the latter part of the outbreak, we realised there was an operating theatre at the heart of this and, th and that cleaning up that operating theatre led to uh, control of the outbreak. <coughs> also been involved um, recently in, in kind of what you might call Darwin in the drugstore, so Dar uh, Darwinian evolution as a source of <coughs> antibiotic resistance, um, where we sequenced uh, two isolates from the same patient, same organism, one before uh, treatment, one after treatment, and, and uh, one before treatment was susceptible to the antibiotic, the one after treatment had become resistant, and we sequenced the whole genome and managed to detect some changes between them. And we found surprising, uh, well, we found a, a mutation in the gene that was already known to be associated with resistance, but we also found um, parts of the genome falling out um, and losing DNA repair. That was kind of counterintuitive. You kind of think, well, things, the later things in the outbreak are going to, or in a, in a particular transmission chain, they're going to have more DNA rather than less. But here it was a loss of DNA. And in fact, this is an interesting many of these themes that we're seeing in terms of sequence evolution, genome evolution, there are parallels here between microbiology, what happens in microbiology, and what actually happens in the evolution of cancers in patients as well, because when a, a cancer uh, evolves, it, it, it starts to lose DNA repair and become much more um, uh, susceptible to muti muti mutagenesis. And we're actually currently following up on this work now. We're starting to look at multidrug resistant uh, TB isolates from West Africa uh, with colleagues um, in the Gambia, a PhD student of mine, Madike Senghor, and with Martin Antonio, uh, one of my former PhD students who now works in the MRC unit in Gambia. 2011, we got involved in what you might call social evolution, where we are basically uh, catalyzing evolution with our own discipline. So we, uh, particularly Nick Lohman, who was working for me at the time, um, we pushed the boundaries where this outbreak had been going on in Germany, uh, the, uh, uh, the Chinese Genomics Institute, BGI, had genome sequenced an isolate from the outbreak, uh, but hadn't really done much analysis on it. They just released the raw data. And then Nick did a 
an initial analysis on this and said, well, these Chinese guys have just released this data without any um, usage rights or anything. Uh, he did his analysis, released it again, and then he called on the rest of the scientific community to help analyse that. And actually what happened within a, 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 a couple of weeks, there were dozens and dozens of analyses done as a kind of crowdsourced analysis. People on different continents, uh, North America, uh, Africa, uh, Asia, Europe, you know, people in Hong Kong, uh, all using Twitter and blogging and so forth. And, and so we wrote this up for the New England Journal of Medicine um, as an example of how things were evolving in terms of methodology. What happened then was that we actually were also in, in, in collaboration with the German guys who were at the centre of the outbreak. We would not actually met them when we wrote up that paper, but we went over and saw them. We are drinking champagne, celebrating the fact we got this New England Journal paper, and we said, well, what shall we do next? Where can we, how can we top this? Uh, well, let's think about what we have as unique assets. And I said, well, we know how to do genome analysis and maybe metagenome analysis. And they said, well, you've got a freezer full of shit. We've got 200 or more samples from that outbreak. That's a unique resource. I said, yeah, why don't we take your unique resource and start sequencing it? Um, and that was the birth of the next project, where we looked into whether we could just extract the DNA from those faecal samples and... Um, and sequence it without trying to grow the bacterium first. So in a sense, we were challenging that paradigm that goes back to the 1880s, that basically you have to grow the bacteria as single colonies and do all your microscopy and identify them carefully and then work on them. We said, why don't we just take that sample and sequence the DNA? So we did that, um, and to cut the long story short, it worked. We managed to reconstruct Nick particularly with some uh, mental gymnastics, remarkable mental gymnastics, assisted by Chris Quince, who's coming to work uh, here in Warwick in a few months' time. The two of them together basically uh, reconstructed the E. coli genome from just from the DNA sequences from the, the stool samples uh, from the metagenome. And we wrote that up in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, and I've written a little review on this called Diagnostic Metagenomics as to how this might go forward. In fact, on the telly a few weeks ago on Midlands Today, saying the same kind of thing. Um, we're also taking this forward now. Um, there's Emma Doughty with, with, with Medicaid in the Gambia. She's out there currently uh, collecting uh, sputum samples, and we're hoping to use this approach to see if we can get TB genomes directly out of sputum samples uh, without having to grow the organism first. So as we're in the last year or so, we've, we've also taken on a new line of work, which is actually seeming to, to explode, really. We're now looking at ancient and historical DNA samples. And here we're, we're looking at genomes not as documents of evolutionary history, but as, as documents of human history. Um, so this uh, first uh, came into our, um, uh, into our lab and, uh, with this uh, work on TB in a mummy, where we looked at uh, some mummified material, 200-year-old mummified lung, extracted the DNA, sequenced it, and were able to, to reconstruct the genome of uh, the causative organism, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, that was work done by Jackie Chan and, and Martin Sargent, uh, with help from Helen Donoghue there. Um, we've also been working with Vince Gaffney, who's sitting at the back there, um, and Rob Allaby, looking at uh, sediments, 8,000-year-old seafloor sediments, and extracting DNA and sequencing them. Uh, Rob has actually been leading on the analysis on that work, but it's been interesting to see that work catalyzed looking at ancient DNA. More recently, we've actually found a, a Brucella melatensis genome from medieval human remains uh, from the, uh, the early 14th century. And that's actually been, th that, that is, that's what you might call vaporware, that paper that I presented there, because it's actually what it will look like if it gets published in PNAS. Uh, but we're struggling with PNS at the moment as to whether they wish to accept it or not. So it will get published somewhere anyway. Um, and we're now uh, working with Raffaella uh, Bianucci um, uh, on other samples. So um, Gemma Kane, my group, at, the, at this moment is over in Hungary collecting uh, material from Egyptian mummies. Uh, we hope to get material from mummies from a place called Fayum, uh, where remarkably these mummies actually come in a casket that has a portrait of the individual. So you have these wonderful portraits of these people from the, the first century. Um, and so if we could actually get into the, to the metagenomes and recover uh, pathogens, that would be really interesting. I did also point out, though, to Raffaella that 
the inhabitants of the Mediterranean region haven't changed much over the last 2,000 <laughs> years. They do look quite similar. Um, and we're also, she's uh, recently just said that we want to look at the remains lung from uh, uh, the first French queen, Aragon, uh, from the, I think, the 6th century. Uh, so we've got lots of interesting things going on here in ancient DNA. Another area we started working on since we moved to Warwick, really, is um, if we try and draw evolutionary trees using sequences and then you apply the gram stain, sometimes they don't agree. Most of the time they do agree, so gram-positive organisms all belong in one group for, uh, for the most part. But there is a group within that group of gram-positive organisms that suddenly is now gram-negative, and we can't understand that. It's, it's a real puzzle, um, and Richard Brown in my group is trying to actually uh, tease that apart and work out how is this, how can you explain this in evolutionary terms that a group of gram-positive suddenly become gram-negative. It, it's a really weird thing. So this year, um, as you heard, we won this MRC funding. Um, I think the key sign that you've arrived is that you're actually important enough to, to have the piss taken out of you or to be parodied. Uh, if any of you are actually still awake and reading that, that's not actually what we won the money for. We didn't actually won $13.9 million to spend on Apple Macintosh computers. Um, and uh, my name isn't Professor Stallion, uh, and, Nick <laughs> and Nick Lohman isn't called uh, Dr. Sloman, uh, and, and he's certainly not the most sexy scientist in, in Britain. Um, <laughs> but I am looking forward to, uh, to, we're just kicking this off now, getting started on this project, uh, uh, working with Sam Shepard there, Tom Connor, uh, Nick Lohman, Chris Quince, uh, and there's Mark Achman. Maybe he's the, the, the sexiest uh, microbiologist uh, in the bioinformatics community, the way he's looking very dapper there, putting his tie on. Um, talking to Mark Ackman, uh, he and I, um, you know, people thought I was a little bit odd recruiting a 69-year-old to come and work with me, but it's born, you're 70 now, but at the time I recruited you were 69, but it's, it's born fruit because we've just won this 1. Point, was it 1.4 million, 1.6 million grant uh, on Entero base. But um, there was a very fraught period, as it always is with these, when you're coming up to the moment when that panel's going to make a decision. So the panel makes its decision, and then that has to get ratified. And in that period between the... We knew that the decision had been made, but just needed to be ratified. I actually contacted a panel member, um, and uh, I, I was you know, trying to get any clue. And I, I just turned to Darwin and said, well, this is basically how it's working, isn't it? This is... Basically, there's a struggle for existence that goes on among grant proposals, just there as, as there is among individuals. And I actually, you know, so geeky am I, actually translated Darwin into the modern kind of grant era. But that actually uh, helps me, brings me back to Darwin, and I'm now just about to finish. Again, you don't want to disappoint the audience, and I guess there's probably a large number of you know, here know how I'm going to finish. Uh, I always finish the same way when I give these talks, and that is I'm just going to because uh, Darwin said it the best, uh, and so I'm just going to close with the closing words of The Origin of Species, where Darwin actually uh, summarised uh, this, this whole discipline, where there is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you sincerely for a most scholarly uh, presentation this afternoon, although for a fact it's a rare inaugural which refers to sex with birds. And uh, <laughs> I have to say I didn't hear that bit very much and uh, didn't quite understand it. You've <laughs> You've, you have, I think, made us think uh, a little bit today because I think it is important to see these things in their historical context. I know that, like me, you're an amateur historian. Um, not every age of civilization moves at quite the same pace as we are now. Over the last 150 years, the span of your talk, things have been um, nosebleed quick, uh, I would have said. And what uh, Mark has done is to take us through not only the evolution of species, but also the evolution of thought and technology. And also, I think, shown us how various different strands, including computing, he is, of course, a geek, um, ha have come together to produce these uh, major forward advances. Of course, 
We are in a medical school and so as you might well imagine the matter of evolution is to be seen uh, within the faculty um, including orthopaedic surgeons and other primates um, and indeed onwards and upwards in the I hope there aren't any here uh, <laughs> but I am being filmed onwards and upwards until finally you reach um, medical microbiologists um, he did uh, he did mention you lot didn't he he did mention the family so I think it is appropriate that I end just before thanking him um, with a little bon mot that you might like to remember and this is from the dedication of Haddock's textbook of parasitology which Steve Tour might have on his shelves but uh, the edition I have is dedicated to parents those most humble of hosts and to children those most perfect of parasites. Um, <laughs> I'd just like then to uh, ask you all to thank Prof Palin for what I think has been an extremely diverting talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>